Timothy chapter 2, we need to uh, move along here. There are three more chapters to cover. However, the fourth uh, is fairly you know, personal and, and has things that we've already discussed while considering the setting of the book. And we'll have, of course, we'll speak about some of those things, but we may not need to make as many comments on chapter 4 as on these intervening chapters, chapters 2 and 3. There's a great deal to be said about uh, you, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself in the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hard-working farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Amen. Now, uh, he begins by an, another exhortation for Timothy to be strong. He's told him to be strong, or implied that he's strong earlier. He told him in chapter 1, verse 7, that he should be stirring up a, the spirit that is in him who is to be understood to be a spirit of power. And in verse 9 of chapter 1, or verse 8, excuse me, he says, uh, share with me in the sufferings of the gospel according to the power of God. To share in sufferings or to experience sufferings and to do so as a Christian, and by that I mean in a Christian manner. Not, I mean, everybody endures sufferings whether they're Christians or not, but Christians are supposed to go through sufferings in a slightly different way. For one thing, they should be able to embrace them. Uh, especially if it's persecution for the faith, a Christian should, in a sense, uh, love those sufferings, should, should glory in sufferings, as Paul says in Romans chapter 5. Furthermore, uh, grace is expected to make a Christian endure sufferings in a gracious spirit, which others, though they endure the same sufferings, would not be expected to have. That is, the graciousness of spirit. Here also, Paul stresses that to endure these sufferings requires that you be strong in the grace that God gives. God's grace is that which enables us to suffer uh, fearlessly and graciously. Uh, it is, in other words, an enabling, an, an enabling factor, grace. Uh, we talked about grace in other situations, of course. It has come up many times in the New Testament in our previous studies, and I hope I've made it clear before that in addition to understanding grace as God's unmerited favor, we find Paul and others using the term in the sense of an enabling that God gives to do the work of God uh, in the appropriate manner and to endure, uh, in a Christian manner, suffering. Remember when Paul was talking about the thorn in his flesh, he says, he asked God three times to take it away, but God said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your work. So that the grace of God is a strength given to Paul in his weakness and an enabling. So also he tells Timothy to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, he seems to talk further about the need to be strong in grace at verse 3 and following, but in verse 2, it would appear that he interrupts that thought, though maybe not. Uh, again, in First and Second Timothy, because the letters are so personal, Paul does not bind himself to a strict outline. He sometimes will interject something that comes to his mind, as, for instance, in First Timothy 5, where he threw in the statement that Timothy ought to drink wine and not just water in a place where it was not necessarily called for in the context. Here also, it may be that as Paul is urging Timothy to come to Rome and, and, and to be courageous enough to do so and actually to be in danger and realizing that Timothy too may be imprisoned and die there, but not wanting the things that Paul has passed on to Timothy to die with him. So says, listen, pass those things along to someone else before you come. Uh, it'd be a shame if I and you both died and all that I planted in you died with us both. Now, I'm, I may be reading between the lines, but it does seem to be in the context of enduring hardship and being willing to embrace the sufferings associated with coming to associate with Paul, uh, that Paul says, oh, by the way, the things that you've heard from me, commit them to faithful men who will teach others. Now, this process of committing them to faithful men, we would think would be a, a lengthy process. It would be a discipling process. It would be like educating them, unless Paul means the basic Truths, the most important distinctives of Paul's teaching. Certainly, the faithful in the church already knew a great portion of, of scriptural truths, 
the Paul may mean make sure that you commit to faithful men the distinctive things that I am teaching, which are in contrast to what many of the heretics and other teachers are teaching. Yeah, make sure those are uh, firmly implanted in the minds of faithful men who can be expected to pass them along before you come. He doesn't say before you come, but it, it, it may be implied since the letter is asking for him to come. And if he does come, he may never come back to Ephesus. So Paul would seem to be saying, I, be a, you know, just as I pass these things along to you before I was in prison, make sure that you pass them along to someone else. Now, the others to whom these things are to be passed along are said to be faithful men. Now, faithful men can simply mean men of faith or Christian men, but it's more likely that the word faithful means trustworthy men. Now, you would think that wouldn't be too hard to find. Christians ought to be faithful people. It says in Revelation that those who come with Christ are called and chosen and faithful. <coughs> and Christians are exhorted throughout the Scripture to be faithful as God is faithful, to be faithful to Him unto death. But, I have known pastors, and myself included, though I was not a pastor, who have sought to do this very thing, to entrust to faithful men the things that that they know, that I know. And I, I, and, and I know, for instance, Jim Soderbergh, when he was not a pastor yet, but an elder at, at Calvary Chapel, Santa Cruz, was involved in a uh, program which I think was based on a curriculum from Bill Gothard called Training Faithful Men. And uh, once he had found faithful men, he would meet with them on a regular basis and they'd have homework assignments and so forth. To, it was a discipling process. But the hard thing was not training faithful men, but finding faithful men as he will testify, as I myself have found. Uh, I remember uh, once having read this very verse when I still lived in Santa Cruz before the school was even uh, imagined. And I read this verse and God, you know, I, you know, I'm a teacher. You've given me a lot of insights I want to pass along, but, you know, I don't have one person in particular or a group of persons in particular that I'm training to pass these things along. Give me a faithful man. And he put, he put in my mind the name of John Evans, who was not a, a close friend of mine at the time, but, but I knew him, and he had shown some, he, some diligence as a student of the Word, and I, and I approached him about being disciples of the teacher, and he was interested, in, and interestingly, he became later one of the founding members of the Great Commission School when we moved to Bannon, and there were seven families that started the school, of which he was the only one that really stayed until the very end, that is, until we had to leave Bannon. Uh, it was not possible for all of our staff to move with us here, and he had another opportunity. Uh, he's still on our board of directors. But I thought it was interesting that he's, of, of all the guys who moved to Bandon with me from Santa Cruz, he's the only one that I actually invited. The others invited themselves. And he's the only one that God had put on my heart to really disciple as a teacher. And he became, I think by most people's judgment, the best teacher we had. Uh, some of our students, even after we moved here, had the privilege of having him come up and teach these very epistles. He taught the pastoral epistles here the first year we were in McMinnville. And I didn't have to ask people how he do. And they came back saying, man, he, that guy is a good teacher. And he is. And uh, I feel like God gave me a faithful man, as it were, to pass along things to. And I think anyone in ministry has, has, has their desire to find some faithful men. I've known old men who I think were possibly looking to me as possibly someone to pass the baton to. There was an old man named Fred Bob in Massachusetts who uh, is now deceased, but I met him when I was teaching in Massachusetts, and boy, he, he uh, grabbed on to me and took me to his house and he dominated my time and, and shared with me his vision and so forth, and I couldn't help thinking that, you know, he emphasized how old he was, not, I couldn't help thinking that maybe he's always on the lookout for a younger man to kind of pass along the, the mantle to of ministry. You know, when an old man realizes that his opportunities are, are limited by the fact that he's simply not going to live much longer, there is that tendency of anyone who's got a heart for ministry to, to make sure that his ministry doesn't die with him, but it's, it's passed on to a, a son in the faith. And that, that was Paul's feeling toward Timothy. And now Timothy, though he was still fairly young, had to consider doing that too. His life might be shortened by martyrdom, and therefore he should pass these things along. Now, faithful men, as I said, are not as easy to find as you might think. There are many people, as it says in Proverbs, I wish you could remember the proverb number, maybe someone knows it or has a concordance here, but uh, there's a proverb that says, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man, who can find? And uh, until you start looking around for a faithful man to pass along, 
uh, you know, the, the mantle of ministry to, you don't appreciate how true that was. Saul and Onesimus have discovered it as a leader. Um, and I guess leaders often do because they're always looking for trustworthy men to delegate responsibilities to and so forth. And so many times Solomon made uh, a reference to how vexing it was to entrust an unfaithful person. Like a foot out of joint and a broken tooth, so is an unfaithful messenger. Uh, and yeah, you have the verse? Proverbs 20, verse 6. Okay, Proverbs 20, verse 6. Thanks, John. Um, is the verse that says, uh, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. Uh, anyone who's looked has found few, and I'd really like to urge you young men to be faithful men. It may be that you'll never be in the ministry, but being faithful to God is required anyway, of all Christians. It's like the choosing of elders. And elders aren't required to be super Christians, they're just supposed to be what Christians are supposed to be. It's not always easy to find one to make an elder of. Likewise, all Christians are supposed to be faithful, but it's not always easy to find one that can really be trusted through thick and thin. A lot of people would like to be a teacher. I've many times had people, young guys, attach themselves because they're kind of enamored with the idea of being a teacher. Maybe because they recognize that in certain circles, like a school, teachers, you know, get a certain amount of respect or whatever, and it's desirable to be a teacher. But the question is, will they still want to serve God when it's not in a, in a circumstance that's where they're honored in that role? Uh, will, they, will they still want to serve God with good motives even when God isn't being as good to them as he is the moment in the sense that he puts them through trials or through the meat grinder you know faithful men are people who are unswerving regardless of circumstance and if they swerve in times of hardship they're unfaithful and uh, I would just of course urge all Christians to if, if, even if you don't have a vision of becoming a minister at least be faithful enough to be qualified to be one never know that God might call you. And you women, likewise. Interestingly, Solomon also said it's hard to find a faithful woman in Proverbs 31. He said, who can find a virtuous woman? The same thing he said about a faithful man. A faithful man, who can find? In Proverbs 20, verse 6. But in Proverbs 31, verse 10, he says, who can find a virtuous woman? And he goes on to describe that she's a faithful woman. It's the heart of her husband safely trusted in her. So Paul knew it's hard to find a faithful man and a faithful woman. And obviously both are very important uh, to the to the welfare of the ongoing enterprise of the church. So Timothy was supposed to identify, if he could, some faithful men who could be entrusted as he had been entrusted and to commit to them the things Paul had committed to him. And uh, then they, of course, were to do the same. Another generation of teaching was to go on beyond that where those faithful men then could teach others. They had to be also be apt to teach, clearly. Now... Verse 3, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Clearly this is a continuation of his encouraging Timothy not to be fearful, not to be intimidated, to be strong in the grace that God gives and in the power of God to participate in sufferings. You've got to see yourself in a warlike mode in a sense. So Christians in their actual relationships with other people have got to maintain a, a spirit that's the furthest thing to a warlike attitude. Uh, Christians are not to be uh, promoters of anything but peace in terms of relationships. Although, when one preaches the gospel of peace, they often find that others are not at peace with them. Jesus said, don't think that I came to bring peace. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. But he's not saying that we aren't to have peace, but rather, he goes on to say, for the houses are going to be divided over the gospel. You may wish for peace, like the psalmist in Psalm 120. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war, he says. And that's often the case. You should not, of course, do anything that would create a warlike situation in your relationship with other people, though by the very act of trying to be a peacemaker, you may be persecuted. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, and immediately after it's blessed are those who are persecuted. And often it is people who are, because they're peacemakers, uh, are resented and persecuted. Paul said in Romans chapter 12, as, as much as it's possible... As far as in you, or if possible, as much as in you lieth, be at peace with every man. So as far as your side of every relationship, what you're adding to a relationship, what your contribution should be, nothing but what would ordinarily promote peace, though the other side, there's two sides of every relationship, and there may be some things that are not in your control, the other party may not be as committed to peace as you are. Nonetheless, we're not to be warlike in our relationships, but we are to be warlike in the sense that we see ourselves engaged in a struggle against the powers of evil. 
we don't wrestle against human beings, but we do wrestle against principalities and powers. And these principalities and powers uh, have captured people. It says so at the end of this chapter. In verse 26, it talks about how we need to help people to escape from the snare of the devil who have been taken captive by him to do his will. That's the warfare. The, the world is in Satan's prison house. And we are the Rambos who have to go behind enemy lines and, and get these people out of their prison cells, you know. <laughs> and you've got to have a, a militant mentality. You've got to be prepared to get hurt. No one goes to war without some kind of mental preparation that I might get hurt here. Maybe even die, obviously. People don't go to war without con considering that possibility. And if they are really going to be committed to avoiding that, they don't go to war at all. They desert or they, you know, or they, they go to jail or they do something else. If they're really afraid to get hurt, they simply won't go to war. People who go to war have already made peace with the rea realization that they could die and that that is not the ultimate tragedy. Preserving their life is not going to be their first priority. Although, of course, even in battle, they hope to live. But they, by going to battle, are putting themselves in a situation which they know is far more life-threatening than ordinary life. And not only are they prepared to get hurt and die, they also are prepared, even when they're not confronting the enemy head-on, when they're not in the thick of fierce battle, they're prepared to make some sacrifices, to endure hardship. They don't eat the same kind of meals out on, in the foxholes that they eat when they're at home and have plenty of money and freedom to go to the fancy restaurants. I mean, uh, the rations that they eat, the conditions in which they sleep, yeah. are different than, than civilian life offers. And that is because they are prepared to make certain sacrifices, and one of the major sacrifices is in the area of comfort, for the sake of getting the job done, of getting the battle over with. Now, Christians are to have a warlike mentality, or a soldier-like mentality. Excuse me. I may have shared with you before. It's probable that I have, because there's some favorite things I share frequently. In an article found in uh, the book, Perspectives of the World of the Christian Movement, uh, there's an article by Ralph Winter, who is the founder of the U.S. Center for World Mission in Pasadena, California. An article called uh, Reconsecration to a Wartime Mentality. Anyone ever read that? It's a great article. But he starts it out with a, a description of the Queen Mary, which is, I think, in Harvard in Long Beach, California, and is basically a, a tourist attraction now. But that ship at one time was a luxury liner, but during wartime it was pressed into service as a troop carrier. And they now, if you go on tour in the Queen Mary, you'll see that part is set up the way it was as a luxury liner, and the other part is set up the way it was as a troop carrier. And uh, he describes the difference. I've never, I've never taken that tour. I'd, I'd like to, having read that, I think it would be a very graphic illustration of the point that he's making and which Paul is making here. And that is that persons who are at war definitely live a more Spartan and, and uh, self-sacrificing life than those who are, or don't see themselves as being at war. Because he said, obviously there were spacious cabins in the luxury liner portion, but the same cabins in the war portion had 16 bunks in them, you know. Um, whereas in the luxury liner portion of the ship, they might have eight or nine plates at a table setting for all the courses of the meal. In the war setting, there's a piece of tin with indentions in it for different, for different, uh, you know, items of food. And, you know, the idea here is to show that those who have a wartime mentality are willing to put up with things that, that people who see life as a playground instead of a battleground never would even consider enduring. And as you know, if you've been through a while and detested some of you have, or even coming here, uh, you are here because you're, you feel called to God to be here, and I don't know exactly what all of you will do when you leave here, but obviously you're hoping to be equipped for a continuing uh, in, you know, involvement in the, in the battle against the devil's domain and part of your training period involves you sleeping in situations you probably won't sleep in when you have your choice of living situations now I can't complain about the meals here you probably won't eat this well when you go out but uh, but there have been years where you really had to have a, a soldier's mentality to eat at the meals in our dining hall um, we had different cooks then but the point is I never considered it to be you know asking too much that students, you know, live in tight quarters or eat 
you know, rice and beans or whatever for a period of time. I mean, if they're on battlefield, they probably get worse. And that's exactly what we are. We're in battle. Now, we don't always see it that way. We're not persecuted right now. Uh, we are not living in a deprived country. We are living in a fat country, in a country where Christians are not persecuted, and we lose sight of the fact that we're in the battle. It's not uncommon in certain circles to hear preachers say, you know, we're king's kids. We deserve to live high. We do, if anyone's going to have the good things in life, it ought to be the king's kids, and Christians are children of the king. So we have nice cars and nice homes, and it's a reproach to wear, you know, old clothes and drive an old Volkswagen. I've heard people say that. But these people seem to have lost sight. They seem to be Western in their theology because uh, that theology does not work in the third world because Christians there simply don't have the option of driving Cadillacs. But the, what these people have lost sight of is that although we are king's kids, the king is at war and his kids are in the foxholes. And when you're in the foxholes, you don't live the way you live when the war is over. When the war is over, we'll go home to the palace and we'll, and we'll live like king's kids then. In the meantime, we have to live like soldiers. And Paul says you need to be prepared to endure hardship like a good soldier would of Jesus Christ. And he points out an, an aspect of it. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself in the affairs of this life so that he might please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Now the idea of pleasing God is a, a, a repeated theme in the Bible and one which, though to tell you the truth, I don't remember hearing very many sermons about just the subject of pleasing God. I'm sure there have been some that I've heard, but it seems to me like that's the essence of the whole Christian mentality. The question is, are you living to please yourself or to please God? You can't do both. Or uh, a third option is pleasing men, which is another way of assuring that you please yourself. Uh, Paul said, if I yet pleased men, I could not be the servant of Christ. In Galatians 1, I think verse 10 or 11. Pleasing men and pleasing self is simply not what life is for for the Christian. For a non-Christian, that's all there is, pleasing yourself. But... The, it's like the essential fundamental change in attitude that repentance calls for. When I so, stop being a non-Christian, start being a Christian. When I repent, that is, have a change of mind, one of the fundamental aspects of that change of mind is that I, I repent of living a life to please myself, and now I have a commitment forever after to please God and do whatever pleases God, whether that pleases me or not. It says any soldier knows that. Most soldiers on the battlefield would, would, would be more pleased to be in civilian life at that moment, but they have had to give up their civilian liberties and their civilian comforts in order to please the one who enlisted them as a soldier. And that's what the Christian life is now. We have been enlisted. We are, you cannot dodge this ground. Or if you do, you cannot do it without punishment. You can't do it without loss. And so our outlook on life is that we're here to please our commander and for no other reason than that. And therefore, even involvement in civilian affairs is inappropriate. Now, what are civilian affairs, affairs according to this particular analogy uh, or metaphor? Uh, I'm not sure exactly. It's certainly, he's not saying that you cannot own a business, which is a, you know, technically a secular or, or a civilian kind of thing to do. Uh, I, I, I wonder whether it even implies getting involved in earthly government, you know, uh, like politics or whatever. I'm not sure. I would say this much, though. Even if, even if it is okay for Christians to be involved in all the aspects of worldly society, and I suspect that it is, as long as it's not sinful aspects of worldly society, they're not allowed to have their hearts in those places. They're not allowed to be attached to those things. They must be prepared to drop them in a moment to go to the battle. Uh, and they cannot be engaged, that is, inextricably, where they can't get themselves out of a situation because they're so engaged in some earthly pursuit that they're not available to their commander. And uh, when you leave this school, some of you, no doubt, will feel a call to, to ministry, their own, uh, either domestic or foreign missions. Others may not. Others may be called to more um, civilian-style life, style, you know, getting married and having families and, you know, holding a job and being uh, a light to your culture. You know, and that's okay too. Both are okay. However, the second is is a situation in which people tend to forget that they're at war. If you're out on the mission field, you know you're at war, and trusting God becomes much more uh, a part of everyday life. And resisting the forces of darkness is a, a daily enterprise and an obvious one. But if you move into a a, a more relatively comfortable 
lifestyle, which is not wrong to do if that's, you know, according to God's calling in life, uh, it is possible to forget that you're at war and to begin to think, oh, I deserve a little, uh, you know, upgrading in my lifestyle. I deserve a little better car than, than I have. You know, I, I deserve a few more toys than what I have. And uh, that is simply a discussion we have to be careful about. We have to maintain uh, a full awareness of the spiritual warfare that we're in and realize that spiritual warfare calls us to a, a role in life that is analogous to natural warfare in some respects. Namely, that we don't get too involved in unrelated activities. And uh, we need to be able to endure hardship too. Now, another metaphor changes from the military metaphor to the athletic metaphor. He uses both metaphors elsewhere in his writings as well. So then also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules or lawfully. Exactly his point here, uh, it's not as clear in this verse as in the previous ones what his point is. He, uh, he clearly is saying that if you're in the race at all, you gotta you got to abide by the rules. Maybe he means you can't take shortcuts. The, the athletics there is a specific word in the Greek that refers to uh, participation in the Olympic Games. And so it probably has runners, race, racers, in, uh, you know, foot, foot race runners in, in mind. And they're running for an earthly crown. He points that out in, in chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians also. He gives another illustration from the Olympics and how that those who run in the Olympics actually discipline their bodies and they, they're temperate in all things, and even though they're only doing it for an earthly crown, but we're doing it for an eternal crown. Uh, he, a similar thought, using a similar metaphor, 1 Corinthians. 9 verse 25 here the idea seems to be you don't take shortcuts you got to do you got to do it by the book you got to run the race by the book and if you do something uh, you know if you do anything to make it easier than, than the legal way of doing it if you seek shortcuts or something you may get to the finish line but you won't get crowned you'll you will have lost any uh, advantage or any reward for your finishing and so he may be saying don't look for shortcuts in this life. Don't, in others, don't try to take an easier way. The race is strenuous, and the rules are such that it makes it impossible for you to rightly make it any easier on yourself. You've got to basically go according to the demands of the game. And uh, also in, in ver verse 6, the hardworking farmer must first be, must be first partake of the crops. The way this is worded in the King James used to confuse me. And it still, you know, could be understood more than one way here in verse 6. Um, I thought at one time that Paul was saying something like, if a person, person wants to partake of the crops, he must first be a farmer. Namely, it's sort of like the race analogy. You've you got to run the race if you want the reward. So if you want to eat the crops, you have to first do the work of being a farmer. You have to do the hard work to get involved. But that's not the way he states it. He doesn't state that the one who wishes to partake of the uh, food has to first grow it and work on it, although that would be a truth, that's not the truth he states. And I thought he was trying to get that truth across, but I thought he said it wrong and it used to bother me. I understand now that the stress is on hard work in here. All farmers are going to partake, hopefully, of the crops that they raise, but the farmer who works hard at it certainly is the most worthy to be the first to partake. Uh, the idea is that the advantages rightly go to the person, the privileges, most privileges and rewards of labor go to the person who works the hardest on it. He could have just said the farmer partakes of his crops, but he stresses the fact that it's the hardest, it's the hard-working farmer who is the first to partake of the crops. The idea is that the special privileges and rewards uh, are due to the person who works, who puts the most effort at it. And again, he's telling Timothy something a little bit like the race analogy or metaphor. Uh, you, you run hard so you can get the reward. And uh, also you uh, change the metaphor to that of farming. You have to labor hard to gain the reward. Verse 7, consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. In other words, dwell on these metaphors. Metaphors and figures of speech can be a very helpful way of illuminating truth. Paul says in Romans chapter 6, I, when he's using the analogy of the slave market uh, as, to speak of our relationship to uh, sin and to God, he says, I, I speak in the manner of flesh, or I speak in the manner of men, 
because of the infirmity of your flesh. Meaning, because you're human and you've got, you know, dim insights, I'm using human analogies. I'm using metaphors that hopefully it'll help you illustrate what I'm talking about. Namely, in that case, the analogy of the slave market. Here he gives three analogies, that of warfare, that of Olympic games, and that of farmers, all of which were fairly familiar to a first century Christian. And all of them had some likeness to the Christian life and, and service, which he says, if you just dwell on this, meditate on these things, and you'll get, uh, you, the more you think about the more you'll understand it, the more insight you'll get into what I'm trying to say here. Yes? Is that, is that Romans verse 6? It's in Romans chapter 6, in the latter part, I don't know the verse number, I can find it for you. Verse 19? Yeah, I speak as a matter of men uh, because of the infirmity of your flesh, so because of your natural weakness at understanding spiritual things, I have to give human illustration, which is not really very insulting. We, we are flesh, and it helps us to have some something in our own frame of reference as a point of reference to some unknown spiritual truth. It's hard, it's hard to talk about insubstantial things with, uh, yeah. without using concrete terms that we're familiar with. Well, the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit. They're spiritually discerned. But in communicating them, it's sometimes nice to give illustrations. Jesus did that with Nicodemus. Nicodemus said, how can, you know, what do you mean be born again? He said, well, it's like the wind. You know, you don't know where it comes from, where it goes, but, uh, but you know it exists. And, uh, and Nicodemus says, you know, what are you talking about? How's this, uh, you know, how's this, what, how can these things be? And Jesus said, if I've spoken to you in earthly things, you don't understand. How are you going to understand if I tell you in heavenly things? I mean, it, it should be understood that heavenly things are harder to understand than earthly things. And, uh, Often, earthly illustrations are helpful to clarify spiritual things. Verse 8. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer. That is, not because he is an evildoer, but as if he were. He's being treated as an evildoer. Even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. Uh, the word of God, he knows, the, the fortunes of the gospel do not rest upon Paul's personal survival or, or his good fortunes or even his liberty. As we know from Philippians, when he was in chains in Rome the first time, the gospel was not chained there either. Even within the prison house, he had a, a witness. And apparently he was able to convert his guards, and he says as a result of his chains, the whole household of Caesar had heard of his situation, and now there were saints in Caesar's household to send greetings from Philip to the Philippians. Uh, so even when Paul was in chains, his ministry was not hindered. The word of God continued to go even within the prison house and the household of Caesar and the palace. But what he probably means here, too, is that even if he is put out of commission, the gospel has still got its advocates at liberty and always will. The gospel is going to continue, even if uh, they try to snuff it out by, by imprisoning and killing the leaders. Uh, for instance, Timothy was still at liberty. And if he was arrested, there would be faithful men to whom, Paul, uh, whom Timothy had committed these things to. So it was going to be very difficult or impossible for them to really chain the progress or stop the progress of the word of God, even if they chained up the messenger. Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Now, Paul and to his labor is so that the elect might obtain salvation. This, too, would be, uh, at least by the sound of it, supportive of the Calvinist notion that there are people who are elect, of course, before they're even born, and uh, the idea is that they, and they alone, will obtain salvation. Which the Calvinist understands to mean that a person who obtains salvation will only obtain salvation because he is elect. However, the Arminian could take this verse and says, well, uh, we see it a little differently. They are elect because they obtain salvation. God knows who is going to obtain salvation and has elected them on the basis of that foreknowledge. Now, the verse can be used either way. Uh, uh, the sound of it on the surface sounds more supportive for Calvinism in the sense that he says, I labor with these things for the sake of the elect so that they can get saved. Those who are already elect so that they'll obtain salvation. Uh, but it's as easy, I mean, just about as easy to understand it, meaning if his view is the elect are those that God knows are going to get saved, I'm, 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 my ministry is bringing that to pass. What God knows and has chosen uh, is going to man manifest through their gain of salvation. Now, it's also possible that the elect may mean those who are already saved and who have already demonstrated themselves to the elect, that they may obtain salvation, not so much as that they might get converted. They already have salvation in that sense. But Paul talks about laying hold of salvation even to the Christian, laying hold on the, the eventual and ultimate benefits of salvation, namely 
being faithful to death and going to heaven or you know, obtaining eternal life. Paul, we know in his writings, he talks about salvation in all different ways. Sometimes it's something we already have, and yet sometimes it's those of us who are already saved look forward to. And so he might even just saying, I'm laboring for the sake of the, the church, who are also the elect. And my labors are so that they might remain faithful and obtain the ultimate glorification that is, is part of our salvation. That would match up with the next couple verses then, kind of. It would. It would match up with the following verses because he, he stresses the need for endurance and perseverance. Uh, in verses 11 through 13, he says, this is a faithful saying, if we die with him, we shall also live with him. Now, we die in past tense with him seems to speak of in Christ. The, the fact that, you know, I was crucified with Christ. And those, those thoughts that Paul brings out in Galatians and Romans and elsewhere, that we were crucified, we died with him, and since that is the case, we also will live with him. There's a sense in which we already have been resurrected with him, but he's looking to a more ultimate, final, uh, eternal life in the resurrection. Um, if we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Now, it seems pretty clear here. Uh, Paul, at least in the second clause, if we deny him, he also will deny us, is exactly what Jesus himself said in Matthew 10.33. Matthew 10.33, Jesus said, Whosoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father and his holy angels. And whoever confesses me before men, will confess. Now, taking it from the words of Jesus, one could imagine that he's talking about the difference between Christians and non-Christians. The Christians, or the elect, will confess Christ. Those who are the non-elect or who are not Christians will deny him. But here Paul is talking about we Christians. Even after we have already confessed Christ, if we later deny him, the threat that Jesus made still applies. It's not just to those who never confess Christ and deny him all the time, but even those who have confessed Christ as Christians before, if denying him later, can look forward to it. Now, some think that verse 13 would preclude that. It says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Some some of us do this to mean that God stays faithful to us and keeps us faith even if we lose faith. Even if we depart from the faith. Even if we die in unbelief. If we are faithless, yes, God abides faithful. And therefore, we're secure eternally despite our own perseverance. If we persevere, if we don't, this, this last verse 13 is used especially by the antinomian type of eternal security, which teaches that if you ever get saved, you're in there. And God will faithfully hold on to your soul even if you don't faithfully hold on to God, even if you run off and die in unfaithfulness to God. Uh, yet he's faithful, he can't deny himself. I certainly don't understand it that way. But I understand, I mean, he's already said he'll deny us if we deny him. He's not going to turn around in verse 13 and say something that's just the opposite of that. And what he did say in verse 12 is agreeable with what Jesus said. We can't, we can't take that as the weaker statement of the two. We have to harmonize verse 13 with what he said in verse 12, not try to see it as in, in tension with it. In verse 13, what I believe he's saying is, right, there's a couple ways to look at it. One is, even if we don't believe it, it's still true. That is, if we don't believe that God is this way, that he, you know, that, that uh, if, he deny, if we deny him, he also will deny us. Maybe you may not believe that, but it's still true. God doesn't deny himself. He will deny those who deny him, but he won't deny himself. That is, he can't go against his own grain. He can't go against his own nature, his own character. It's similar to what Paul said in Titus 1-2, where he says, God who cannot lie. Some people have asked, can God make a rock that he cannot move? And, and you know, the reason that's a difficult statement is they usually ask first, can God do everything? And when they trap you into saying, yes, God can do anything, they say, then can he make a rock that can't move? And then you've got a, a dilemma. Because if you say yes, then you admit there's a rock that he can't move, or there could be a rock that he can't move, and that's something he can't do, is he can't move it. On the other hand, if you say no, then he can't make such a rock, in which case there's something he can't do. And so in either case, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't, yay or nay, in either case, suggests a, uh, something that God cannot do. And the, some Christians have been trapped in this simply because they made the wrong answer to the first question. Can God do everything? They say, yes. Think twice before you answer that way. There are some things God can't do. He cannot lie, Titus 1, 2 tells us. James tells us he cannot be tempted with evil. And this passage shows he cannot deny himself, which may not be altogether clear what that means, but it seems to me to mean he cannot act in a way other than his own principles. He cannot 
he cannot act contrary to who he is. He cannot do anything that would not be agreeable with who he is by nature and character. In such a case, we could say to the question, can God make a rock he can't move? I'd have to say, no, he can't, because no such rock could ever exist, because such a rock would defy his omnipotence, and it would therefore be a denial of himself to create something that denied his own nature of omnipotence. He cannot, no such rock could ever exist, and even God couldn't make one that was bigger than him or stronger than him, because it would be a denial of his own supremacy. Now, that's the way I would answer it. You might answer it a little differently. But the point is, the Bible clearly says there's some things God cannot do. And he can do anything that he wants. But he cannot even want to do things that are against his nature or character to do. And therefore, those things can never be done. They can be said to be impossible. Now, what does that have to do with this passage? It means... These are God's principles that he's laid out. If we confess him, if we're faithful, if we endure hardness and suck with him, we'll reign with him. If we don't, if we deny him, then he'll deny us. That's his decree. Believe it or not, it's still true. He can't deny these principles. He can deny you, but he can't deny himself. He cannot deny what he has said. You may not believe it. But it's still true. He's faithful to be what he said he would be. He's faithful to deny us, if that's what, if that's what our actions call for. Now, another way of saying faithless there might simply mean even if we backslide and lose our salvation and we deny him and he denies us, yet that is no, that is no criticism of him. He still remains untainted. You may be faithless, but he won't be. You may die in your sins and go to hell, but God, no one can blame God for that. He's still faithful to be all that he should be. It's similar to what Paul said in, in uh, where is it? Uh, in Romans 11, or uh, no, Romans 9, and also in Romans uh, 3, a couple times. In Romans 3, especially verse 3 and 4, Paul says, for what if some did not believe? What if some were faithless, some Jews? He's talking about how God had made promises to the Jews. Conditional promises, but they were promises to the Jews. But what if some of the Jews have been faithless? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? In other words, is God the less faithful because they have, they have failed to appropriate what he promised? Because their unbelief says, certainly not. Indeed, let God be true in every man alive. Certainly the meaning there is some of God's people to whom we make promises have not participated in those promises, have not been saved. Some of God's chosen people are now lost. Does that mean that God is unfaithful to what he promised? No, it's them that's been unfaithful. Some of them have been faithless, but God's faithfulness is not in view. And that could easily be what he means here. In fact, it seems very strongly likely to be what Paul means in a similar situation where some of some Christians to whom eternal life has been promised may not end up having it. Why? They're faithless. Does that mean God's unfaithful? No. It means they're unfaithful. God is still faithful. You know? Though we be faithless, yet he abides faithful. He's unchanging. He can't deny himself. He's always going to be the same. And the same means he is this way. If you harm it, bring your life into harmony with him, you're on good terms with him. If you bring your life out of harmony with him, you're on bad terms with him. There's no getting around it. He doesn't change. He's not going to change to bring himself into harmony with you when you're in the wrong path. He's going to stay always the same. Your only hope is to bring yourself into agreement and stay in agreement with him. If you deny him, walk away from him, whatever, he's not going to pursue you. He's not going to modify himself. To be more like you, he's not changing standards. Say, well, I'll make a special case for you. He's going to be what he is. You may lose it, but God has not changed. By it. His faithfulness is not impugned by our faithlessness if we back And that's what I understand the, the, the most Pauline meaning uh, likely to be in here. Okay, verse fourteen. Remind them of these things charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit. <clears throat> to the word of the years, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker 
who does not need to be ashamed, rightly divide the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. Now, verse 15 of the King James begins with the word study. And, uh, you know, a lot of people have understood this to be a scripture advocating Bible study. Because it says study to show yourself the proof. This just comes from a misunderstanding of the old English word study. The translation of the King James is a good one. It's simply that the English language has changed this in, in older English, in Elizabethan English, the word study meant to be diligent. And the Greek word here means to be diligent. So the King James translators were not doing the wrong thing by using the, the word in their language that meant to be diligent. The trouble is that since their time, the word study has come to have the, the idea of uh, reading and academic education and so forth, and that's not what it meant. Study to show yourself truth means 